Disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed in Radio DMG may or may not be the views and opinions of the DMGI's family of sites. All music used in this podcast is the property of whoever made it, and no copyright infringement is intended. God bless this albatross, and hold on tight for the awesome you're about to receive. It's good to be the king. And welcome to this edition of Radio DMG. I am your host, Philip Wesley, the Mile High Mouth, out here in Denver, Colorado, represent. Anywho, (laughs) today's show is actually going to be kind of long, but it's 100% newsity. So, we're going to have the latest newsity, the upcoming konami e3 event in fact e3 2011 is starting well not the actual show but the press conferences the hype we're looking at well before i get into the newsity we're looking at playstation network is up we have the launch lineup for the eShop. we have konami's press conference in under 40 minutes in fact i'm watching a countdown right now as we speak it is coming and Yes, that's when the hype starts, ladies and gentlemen. First particular um, conference of E3, Konami. Today, in about 40 minutes. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is record my introductions. Keep in mind, by the way, um, if you hear a little bit in the background like a fan, that's because I have the fan running full blast because it is extremely hot here in Colorado. We are having a hot day today. Uh, It's a high of, I think, 80. Literally, it's like um, a high of sweltering hot with a low of still very hot. Out here in Denver, Colorado, this has been your weather, and I've been your weather person from the weather underground. Not really. I'm not a terrorist like other people from the weather underground. You know, Bernadine Dorn. um, Oh, what is that one guy's name? Ah. He used to live next, he lived next door to Barack Obama, was at the christening for his kids, that type of person. But let's put politics aside. This is not urban terrorism radio. No, if you want to do that, you can always tune in to Chris Matthews whenever that slur gets back up on the, uh, yeah, I called him a slur. Huh, look it up. Anywho, let's put politics aside because what we're going to talk today is about anime and video games and newsity it's a hundred percent newsity i have literally like an hour or so long script and there's more news pouring in all the time so what i'm gonna go ahead and do is give you my predictions for the um nintendo 3ds and for nintendo's project cafe and some ideas on what the mysterious new controller is going to be of course these are going to be ridiculously technical so If you are turned off by or scared of terms like conductive electricity, sorry, conductive energy transduction, harmonic transduction, or anything that says transduction in it. Transduction just means to like push through. I'll try and make it as clear as possible with some of my ideas for what this controller could be. Now, I guess I can go ahead and say this, that uh, when I was... um, When I went to E3 for the first time, I accidentally ended up in a spot where I wasn't supposed to be, and I heard some stuff I wasn't supposed to hear, and then when I came back the next day, I ended up getting dragged into signing an NDA and somehow ended up working for a peripheral company for a while. So, just a moderate disclaimer, I worked for Newbie LLC as a uh, a consultant for a couple years, and if they'd have followed my advice, they'd still be in business. I mean, back when the Game Boy Advance was coming out, I was saying, hey, we should make something to cover the screen. Kind of like what you see on PDAs. And they're like, why would anybody buy that? La, 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 la. Scratches on the screen. Nobody cares. La, 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 la. And guess what one of the best selling peripherals is? Screen protectors. (sighs) That's what it is. That's how it is. Some companies, you work there and you're just like, well, this will work. And they're like, no, it won't. Why are you telling me this? This Nintendo Wii thing, this isn't going to take off at all. Ha, the Nintendo DS? It will be trounced by the Nintendo, uh, sorry, by the Sony PSP. Or, I mean, seriously, there is a colossal amount of ignorance in the video game industry. And I'll probably address that at some point. Like, for example, uh, I think it was, like, what was it, Ultra Game Players? They had some guy named Bill. I used to talk to him a bit over ICQ and uh, 
I know, ICQ, how ancient is that? And MSN and such, he used to talk with a lot of these people who worked with this magazine. And um, I remember him telling me that handhelds are a dead end and nobody is going to be playing with them in three years. And this was in 1998. Yeah, <laughs> I I'm sure that's working out. I hope nobody hired him. He's just like that uh, Christian nut guy where it's like, you kind of wonder how they stick around. Kind of like Michael Pactor. Now, if I want to get into Michael Pactor, I'm, I think that he's wrong like 60 or 70% of the time. And even he knows it. He makes it up with charisma. Good person. Don't bet any money on him. For the most part. But, man. Yeah, some of these people. But we're not here to talk about other people or talk some smack. We're here to talk some newsity. Which we'll be getting to in just a moment. And, um, it is long. There is a lot. PlayStation Network is back up. We have the eShop. Um, we have details about the eShop. We have more rumors about the NGP, or rather the PlayStation Vita, or PSV. Um, Vita means life, which makes sense because they're trying to, I mean, look at this. This is Sony. They have the PlayStation Home, PlayStation Suite, PlayStation Vita get kind of the idea that's like I mean they're not gonna say PlayStation life but remember when the PlayStation portable was originally announced it was a lifestyle machine in other words I think the I think they were saying if you're an early adapter of this that would somehow make you gay I don't know I don't think that's really what they meant by lifestyle but one look at Kevin Butler and you're like yeah I'm pretty sure there's something uh under the radar belt going on over there uh huh so anyways, PlayStation Network is up again. I'll talk about that and my experiences trying to download Bonk's Adventure for it well, this morning when it was just slowly springing to life. So this is going to be a pretty newsity packed show. That's why it says 100% newsity. And considering I've already filled this with like some innuendo and smack talk, I guess I'm going to have to put a not safe for work tag on this as well. <gasps> Golly! Golly gee, God's wounds, what on earth am, am I talking about? <sighs> Blimey. So, <laughs> I guess I'm going to have to um, talk a little bit more smack. But I will, I will, I will. We'll go into the NGP and Sony and how I am disappoint, Sony. And a little bit of feedback. We'll actually have shout outs in this one. Actually, I know, I know. Seriously, it's like... Yeah, I'm looking over here and Squishy's looking at me and saying, Hey, man, you haven't done any shout-outs ever. You know, Squishy speaks uh, telepathically or something. It's kind of weird. But, um, yeah, we're also going to talk about our upcoming plans for Akon, how we're going to cover E3, and all that good juicy stuff that you, our loyal victims, <clears throat> I mean, um, our loyal uh, listeners, listeners, yes, that's a good word for it, Mmm, very, very good. Enjoy. So, let's get down to business to defeat the Huns and to give you the latest in breathtaking newsity with a little bit of interruption to go watch the Konami show. Because, hey, Konami's E3 press conference is coming up first of E3 2011 and it's going to be some hotness or not. It could be terrible. This is Konami. They could be awesome, like Metal Gear Solid 2 trailer awesome, or awful, like Metal Gear Solid 2 gameplay, story, and beyond. Mm. Who knows? Maybe we'll see Zone of Enders 3. Maybe, uh, huh, maybe we will see them, like, uh, oh, man. I mean, even though Hideo, Hideo, uh, Hideo, Hideo's. Hideo. Hideo Kojima is not actually there at the convention, because he already tweeted that he wouldn't be. And he said they wouldn't be. Even though he's not going to be there at the convention this year, I think the awesome thing would be, like, say, he comes out with, like, a sword and demonstrates Metal Gear Solid Rising, like Raiden style, in real life by beheading Kevin Butler and Kaz Harai for that horrible, horrible screw-up that was PlayStation Network. And the horrible, horrible insult that is the Welcome Back program. It's like a, uh, I guess I could could say that PlayStation owners are like abused spouses. Um, Sony's like, well, 
Welcome home, honey. Did you cook my dinner? Did you get a second job to pay for my sloppiness? And then owner, the um, PlayStation owner is like, yeah, we did, we did. And then PlayStation, or rather Sony, is all like, ha! And it beats them. Like Bobby Kodak beats Courtney Love. I know. You'd think you were listening to the Cross-Border Gaming Podcast. Maybe at some point I should be like, GPTPD, GPT. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. I'm also not going to break into song. Or I could break into some manly tears. Just, just, just like that. It could be like listening to Glenn Beck. <laughs> really? No, not really. I'm just going to go ahead and just let's get on with the newsity. I've been rambling for way too long. And I know that you're interested in the newsity because there is some hot stuff coming up. So after this musical interlude, which is just the newsity theme, because ladies and gentlemen, this is a hundred percent newsity. We're playing at a hundred percent real longer and uncut because it's no i was gonna make some horrible san francisco circumcision joke but i think those are a little played out they're played out like steve colbert's career and welcome back my lovable victims today you my followers my um what did we used to call you on on TMGIs.com? Like, when you was in the forum, or sorry, when it was in the forums, did we call you, like, viruses, viri, or something like that? I'm trying to remember. It's been a while. Ugh. Speaking of been a while, it's been a while since uh, we covered on the ground a uh, E3. Since 2006, actually. Yeah, huh, that was fun. But I won't regale you with E3 stories. I won't regale you with the scandalous details of the alcoholic press or sorry associated press or of the um going ons in the hovels of uh the shire where the people from ign hang out all e3 and just copy paste white paper i I didn't say that at all Hmm. i won't tell you about the scandalous stories of working with other websites and um being there maybe i will at a later point but Today, it's all about the newsity, and we're about um, 15 minutes away from the Konami E3 press conference. Okay, 14 minutes and 35 seconds or so, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I think actually I'll just keep this on and keep covering it Well, it's going on. So, here we go. To the newsity. First things first, for 3DS owners who went out and were lucky enough to pick up Dead or Alive Dimensions, the second round of Dead or Alive Dimensions DLC is coming on out. Here's the schedule. May 31st, we have Kokoro, another costume for her. Um, Actually, some of these we've already passed, about two of them we've already passed. And by the time you hear this, a third one will have already passed. So just keep in mind, this is what you missed. So here we go. May 31st, Kokoro. June 1st, Ayani. June 2nd, Lei Fang. June 3rd, Tina. June 4th, La Mariposa. May 5th, Jan Lee. May 6th, Zack. And the new S rank nightmarish opponent for Throwdown is Tina, who will, um, well, the daughter of esteemed wrestler, um, what is his name? Shoot, what is that guy's name? Mm, I might actually have to check real quick. Hey, I have the time. Hmm. Anyways, let me check real quick on that. Open up the 3DS. I never really turn this thing off. It just returns to its cradle. Huh. But yeah, um, do, 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 what is that guy's name? He's kind of like the, um, he's kind of a uh, Dead or Alive take on uh, Macho Man Randy Savage. You know, down the whole, oh yeah, type thing. Oh yeah, I, I, I actually need some water because, well, when I said it was like 80 degrees, it's actually closer to 90 with all the humidity. And the humidity is awful for some reason. Actually, it makes me kind of uh, nostalgic for uh, for Missouri because we didn't really have um, that kind of weather. I mean, it was hot sometimes, but most of the time it was just cold. 
Oi, 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 oi. Okay. Bass. 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 Like Lance Bass or something. Yeah. Anyways, Tina is your throwdown opponent. She's the daughter of Bass, who is apparently some type of wrestler. They both have pro wrestling style um, moves. Um, she, her job is pro wrestler. Age 22. Birth date. December 6. Height, weight, 5'9", 123 pounds. Measurements, bust, 37. Waist, 24. Um, height, 35, I guess. Blood type, O. So, yeah, and that's your uh, Dead or Alive report. And, um, yeah. There is some more DLC coming out for that. And it'll be pretty great. So, okay, the big thing with the NGP, according to my notes over here, is that everyone's saying it's going to be called the Vita, which makes me think of Velveeta, and that's kind of how it's pronounced. A little bit like Velveeta, like like the cheese. Yeah. Ah, uh ha. -huh. So, we'll find out next week if that's accurate, although all the sources so far say, yeah, that's right, it's the PlayStation Vita. Kind of like how they have PlayStation Suite, PlayStation Home. And they talked about the PlayStation Lifestyle when the original PlayStation Portable came out. Remember, it was supposed to be a lifestyle device, meaning it would make you metrosexual. I'm, I'm not really sure how that works. I think there's like an attachment that comes with um, Sony, the, sorry, the Sony Vita, PlayStation Vita, that instantly emasculates you. Which, if you're a Sony customer, you should be used to that. I mean, Sony is literally the, uh, they're the wife beaters of, um, the industry. I mean, Microsoft, Microsoft is kind of like the little engine that we thought couldn't, but did. Um, Nintendo is like that stately old person that sits there and says, You young whippersnappers, here is a new product. Enjoy. And then people go, wow, they've got a legacy to them. This must be good. It's not like it's the same game over and over again, which it actually is. A lot of the industry just puts out the same games over and over again. I mean, you've got what? Killzone 4. Oh, sorry, Killzone 3. There's no 4. Mm. Um, Uncharted 3. Uncharted. Um, I forgot what they're calling the one for the, for the um, PlayStation Vita. It has something to do with gold. And Atlantis. So, okay. Anywho, Sony's PlayStation Network Store is finally back up. It is, of course, buggy as all hell, and they only added one PlayStation 1 Classics title to it. Missile Command. I'm like, woo. They did, however, add a few T um, TG Turbo Graphics, 16 games. Um, notably, Alien Crush and Bonk's Adventure. Now... When I heard that PlayStation Network was going to be online, like today, this morning around midnight or so, I started messing around with this PlayStation Store, see if it would show up. And it did, actually. Um, I ended up purchasing Bunk's Adventure, um, and it took it a while to... Um, it wouldn't connect all the time. When it would connect, it would hit a point like 5%, 45%. At one point, it hit 78% on a 13 megabit file and then told me that it would take about three days or so, three to four days to finish downloading. And I'm like, ugh. Finally, after tons of, um, well, a lot of time wasted hitting the O button and the X button, O button, X button, O button, X button, over and over and over again to get the stupid thing to connect properly, it finally downloaded that 13 megabyte file. It only took about three hours. Well, not really three hours. I think I went to sleep for a while, then woke up and there, yeah, I fixed it. Well, I, I mean, I downloaded it. And um, it was it was okay. It's a good game. Definitely worth checking out. But that's that for the newsity on that. Um, there will be some more stuff about the NGP that I will have to mention. For example, remember when I predicted that they'd have remastered PlayStation Portable games on it? Well, it looks like the soft, the hardware itself does that already to the software. Now, the um, the resolution for PlayStation Portable games, sorry, for PlayStation Vita games, is four times the resolution for the original PlayStation Portable. So, it just 
pops it up to four times the resolution, adds some aliasing here and there, and voila! It kind of remasters it a little bit, and you can use the second stick for... Um, you can set what it does, because it's emulating PlayStation portable games on the NGP. That's how it works. Kind of like with the DS, I, sorry, DS on 3DS, whereas the DS on 3DS puts it up to a 1.25% um, larger resolution. The um, PlayStation Portable to NGP or to PS Vita, um, let's just call it the PSV or the Vita. Let's just call it the Vita. Man, it sounds like I'm talking about someone behind their back. It's like, did you see Vita? God, what a slur. But yeah, um, the PSP to Vita really um, suffering suck attached. I think they really want you to have some type of horrible lisp when you say it. So, if I play PlayStation Vita, the from the PSP to the PlayStation Vita, this, uh, you can go ahead and check the resolution. Yeah, that's um. I hate you, Sony. Don't name your crap like this. Really, don't do that. PSP two is fine. Super PSP is actually better. But PlayStation Vita. I mean, for all the flack that people gave the Wii, which um, was just a weird choice anyways, the PlayStation Vita... <sighs> did you focus group this? Did you honestly focus group this? And if you did, um, Bobby Kodak and uh, Courtney Love do not count as a focus group. They count as insane people. Insane people who want to charge you for Call of Duty. Well, not for Call of Duty multiplayer, but for aspects of it. Yeah, um... What's the best way to put it? Sony, whoever advised you to say, Hey, PlayStation Vita, it'll work. Punch them. Beat them up on stage with Kevin Butler. Actually, that'll make us happy because of the whole welcome back package. Which is essentially like, um... They're saying, hey, here's a couple games that you might already own, but you can get them for free as digital versions. And then you can trade in the original game thing for about two bucks over at GameStop or whatever. So, yeah, you put out a pretty worthless welcome back program. I was kind of hoping for Ghost of Sparta, but I guess Mod Nation Racers will be okay. I mean, at least it's something free. And a month, month, free, so the month free subscription to PlayStation Plus... Wow, that's really useful for PSP owners. That's about as useful as that curiosity service. I mean, wow, cloud-based stuff. I know that many people love the cloud, but ugh, the infrastructure is not there for the cloud to be anything useful. It's kind of like the um, old adage that one rotten apple spoils the pot, or rather spoils the bar barrel. Um... How do you filter bad data out on the cloud? How do you prevent corrupted data out on the cloud? How do you prevent hackers from taking down your cloud for over a month by, you know, using a little bit of Amazon subroutines? Isn't that what happened with PlayStation Network? Do we learn something from here? What do we learn from PlayStation Network? Maybe we learn that when people don't store your credit card information, like... Nintendo doesn't store your credit card information. It can be a little bit of a hassle, but it's more secure. And it's fine. Maybe we should learn that just because Sony's PlayStation Store is nice and slick doesn't mean that they're not potential abusers. It's not doesn't mean that they're I mean that their welcome back package isn't akin to putting a bunch of rocks in a pillowcase and then beating the customers with it. Personally, actually, if they could put rocks in a pillowcase and beat anybody, I'd love for them to br drag Howard Stringer, Kasarai, and Kevin Butler up on stage and just beat them to death in front of the audience. Yes. They could even get Peter Moore or, um, oh, who's in charge? Oh, Jay Allard. Yes, yes. As an apology, Jay Allard should beat um, Kevin Butler... Um, Kazurai. Is it Kazurai? Yeah, Kazurai. 
and Howard Stringer to death on the stage at the Sony press conference. That will make things right. It could also be the Microsoft press conference. They're like, hey, our infrastructure works. We didn't, we didn't, um, we did not, oh, how would you do that? So when you take something offshore, when you, when you farm out something, we didn't, um, do, 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 what is that? It, it's like what happens to American jobs where they farm it out, not farming out. It's, um, do, 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 do. we didn't ship out our security to a third party. We didn't outsource it. Outsourcing. That's it. Yeah. That's what they really should do. Hey, I'll run Sony. I could do a better job. You're welcome. Anyways. Yeah. Let's see where we are on the Konami thing that's coming up. We are one minute and 29 seconds away from that. Now I was contemplating turning off the microphone and then watching it and then coming back to you with the news. And that is exactly, <clears throat> and that is exactly what I decided to do. I was going to go ahead and record myself talking about the Konami conference as it was going on. However, it appeared, well, the live feeds were awful. And there's a lot of stuff that doesn't pertain to portables. Um, so, here's what I did. Instead, I called the information... And I'm going to go ahead and read off this information before I get into the other information. What I'm going to go ahead and do is go with this information, then take a break, because I have some other stuff to do, and then come back with more information. There's a lot of news that he's still left to do. So, what was shown off at the Konami E3 2011 pre-E3 press conference? Well, first off, they showed Metal Gear Solid 3D Snake Eater. Um, it features optical photo camo. You take a picture and turn it into camouflage. So right now, you, well, the um, the um, example they gave was taking a picture of a flower and dressing Solid Snake up in that. But we all know what people are going to take pictures of and what they're going to wrap for Solid Snake in so um yes it features optical penis camo hmm oh it also uses the gyroscope for things in the gameplay like let's say you're climbing a tree or on a bridge you could shake the 3ds and snake will fall off wherever he is that sounds incredibly useful um the gameplay looks pretty good kind of a cross between uh peace walker and such but at the end of the demo, he sees a wild Yoshi. I'm wondering if he can catch and eat it, which would be pretty great if they do that. And they also showed off Never Dead and placed PES 2012. And the funny thing about Never Dead is that they spent way too much time on it. And they also said that it's the first game where the hero cannot die. I guess they've never played Wario Land 2 on the Game Boy. Yeah. Then they showed off some Silent Hill stuff. It was kind of great to see Tom Hewitt, formerly of Atlas, and before that, Team Excalibur. Um, again, he's working. He was showing off some of the stuff for the new Silent Hill movie, which will be in 3D and which should be interesting. They also showed off um, a little bit of the new game, and they announced Silent Hill Book of Memories for the PlayStation Vita, or rather NGP, or whatever you want to call it. And then they had Kojima come out. He had Mega64 do a neat little skit. And, um, yeah, it was amusing. Koshima's an interesting case. His big idea, his social gaming network, is called Transfaring. 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 Yeah, that's, uh, horribly racist sounding. The idea is that you can transfer your saves from the PSP version of Peace Walker to the PS3 version of Peace Walker that is included with the Metal Gear Solid HD collection. In other words, this is the same thing that can be done with save files between PS1 Classics on the PSP and PS1 Classics on the PS3, but Kojima invented a stupid word to call it. I think we were calling that a uh, connectivity or, um, oh, what was the other thing? There's, there's a bunch of different buzzwords. He eventually put together a buzzword, and it's got a little blue and white logo, and it's, well, yeah, whatever. He wants to use this for use on... Um, PS2 and PS3 games with the NGP or PS Vita and um, the HD collection which will be out November 11th 
will also be on the Xbox 360 as well as the PS3. The PS3 one's the only one with which obviously has the transferring aspect, which if you ask me is just, eh, okay, whatever. Anyways, he also showed off the Zone of Enders HD collection, which should be about out around the same time or something, but that one apparently has the transferring logo on it, so some type of Zone of Ender ports for the Vita, probably? Eh, he didn't really go into it much. He also announced the Fox engine and did not say whether this would be used on the Vita or Project Cafe. He did demonstrate it a little bit with an Xbox 360 controller, so it works on modern consoles. So it definitely will work on the NGP and the CAFE. Um, then nothing was said about Castlevania. Although he did have, after the credits of this production, a big fiery sea to say, yeah, Contra, it's coming. So I guess we will see Contra 3DS, possibly at Nintendo's conference. And possibly on the NGP as well. Oh, sorry, Vita as well. Other than that, the Konami press conference was... Kind of boring. Um, way too much time spent on PES, and I'm not really a big fan of that. Oh, well. Hmm. Anyways, let's get back to a little bit more news. Um, what was mentioned on the Nintendo eShop. Now, Nintendo's eShop lineup has been revealed. Um, since I only care about the American launch, that's all I'm going to mention. Um, the browser will be out. It does not support Flash or HTML5, although it natively supports MPO files in 3D. And you can also spend, suspend a 3DS game, browse the internet, and then resume that game. And there will be a way to upload M MPO files that you took to a special page to share them with other people. Um, the eShop will be there on June 6th, and the prices look to be $4 for Game Boy games, $6 for 3DS wear. And the Game Boy games that will be available at launch are Super Mario Land, Radar Mission, and Alleyway. Yeah, um, let's see. Let me read that list again. It's Super Mario Land, Radar Mission, and Alleyway. Unfortunately, none of those is The Legend of Zelda, Link's Awakening, DX, or any of the Game Gear games which are supposed to be at launch. However, apparently it's not at launch. It's at launch window. So, I suppose that we'll probably see the NES Classics, um for Legend of Zelda and Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening DX, you know, for the Game Boy Virtual Console um, sometime soon, within the next couple weeks after that. Uh, let's see, we've got... Well, Super Mario Land, you should definitely check out. There's some excellent music in that game. It's great. I have a review of it up on the site in our Game Boy section. Same thing with Alleyway. I'm not really a big fan of Alleyway. In fact... Alleyway is my arch nemesis. I hate Alleyway. But I also love Alleyway. I have a abusive relationship with Alleyway. Alleyway is a breakout clone. And it has a few additional tricks. It does this cool looking thing with shifting blocks and advancing blocks. And then there's these bonus rounds that look like characters from the Mario Land game. Ugh. <sighs> It angers me because whenever I play Alleyway, my brain just is sitting there going, no, don't play this. Anything but this. Don't play this. Don't. Don't. No, don't play Alleyway. Don't do it. That's my brain. But my body is like, mm, Alleyway, okay, yeah. It's like my mind's telling me no. But my body is telling me, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's my love-hate relationship with Alleyway. Overall, uh, I'm probably going to end up getting it. I mean, it's Alleyway. It'll sit there and abuse me. <laughs> oh, Nintendo, don't do that. Don't be Sony. Don't Alleyway me. Yeah, <sighs> Alleyway. Alleyway. <sighs> Anyways, Radar Mission, though. I wonder how the multiplayer works on Radar Mission. If I remember correctly, the multiplayer on Radar Mission, you could pass the Game Boy around for one of the versions of the game, and then the other one, you could Game Link and do like a little first person battle. Um, alleyway, 
has two game modes. Sorry, not rally a radar mission. Radar mission. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, radar mission. I should do a review of that one before it launches. Because, like, we have reviews on dmgice.com. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have uh, reviews for Super Mario Land and Alleyway online right now. Check them out. There's an audio review of Super Mario Land in the last Radio DMG. So, yeah, the last, not the, not the last one. Not that E3 one, but the one before that. The one with all the music has a uh, review of Super Mario Land in it. And, of course, we'll probably read off the review of Alleyway and other ones in future episodes. So, anyways, Radar Mission. Radar Mission has two game modes. One of the game modes is a battleship clone, and the other one, the other mode, is a first-person sub-hunting game, a la Steel Diver. That being said, if Steel Diver had a 3D battleship clone in it, Steel Diver would have sold a, a lot better. Hell, if it had had an online battleship clone and an online first-person sub-hunting game, man, that would have been, that would have been it. That would have been great. Hmm. Oh well, that's Steel Diver. Um, I felt that Steel Diver was pushed out before it before its time. And besides, it should have been called Radar Mission 3DS because then they could put the Battleship clone in there. They'd have precedent. Kind of like how I'm looking forward to Wave Race. Uh, sorry. Uh, um, I'm I'm looking forward to games that are on the 3DS that aren't. Um non-established properties uh, um, <clears throat> anyways uh, anyways radar mission is awesome it has a really sweet music it's got a really great battleship clone and it's more fun to play it with another person I have two I bought this game twice so I could play against people with a game link cable now if the game link cable stuff works wirelessly on the 3ds like I think it does. Awesome. Because, frankly, the some of these Game Boy games have some amazing two-player options. Um, Fortified Zone is co-op. Um, Metal Gear Solid, Ghost Babel, if that comes to Game Boy Color Virtual Console on the 3DS, that one has this really great um, two-player mode, which involves um, setting traps and things and and um, you can't see where your opponent is unless they end up in your accidentally end up in your eyesight. But you can't really track where they are too. So it's kind of this odd little game of cat and mouse where you're setting up booby traps and things. It's like Spy vs. Spy. Which, by the way, there's a really awesome Game Boy Color only version of Spy vs. Spy. I would gladly pay 8 bucks for it if they brought it over to the Virtual Console on the 3DS. I know, I know. I don't like to call it Virtual Console, even though I have to. Virtual Pocket will never die. <sighs> yeah, yeah the, way you make it, the way I make it sound, it's almost as if I'm hinting at like a Soul Calibur game or something for the 3DS. Yeah, but I wouldn't be hinting at that at all. Nope. So ignore that in the Wave Race comment, okay? Please, please just ignore those. Good. Anyways, those are the three virtual console games that launched the system. Hopefully, we'll see Fortified Zone, Avenging Spirit, Legend of Zelda, Link's Awakening DX, Balloon Kid. Actually, Balloon Kid has a really good two-player mode, too. But Balloon Kid, yeah, when that comes out, you have no excuse not to buy it for $4. I mean, Balloon Kid is awesome. And if we get some more Game Boy Color stuff in there... Which would you rather pay? Would you rather pay um, four to six dollars for Shantae on the Game Boy Color one on Virtual Console on the 3DS, or would you rather pay almost three hundred dollars for it on eBay? Yeah, a lot of this stuff here, a lot of older Game Boy games and Game Boy Color games are actually more expensive now than I remember them being on that. Remember, these things launched at thirty and twenty, and people thought that was expensive at the time. I saved up $20 to get Alleyway, and I was surprised I bought Alleyway with money that I made when I was younger. 
Oh well, <laughs> that might be why I have such an abusive relationship with it. Alleyway. I don't know why I never got rid of that game. But yet I own it. I bought it. I own it. I occasionally bust it out and play it. And, I, and I'm... and Oi, I don't know what that is. That's just weird. That is just weird. So, enough about Alleyway. Let's talk about 3DSWare. What's coming out for the 3DSWare? Well, there will be a free Pokedex 3D app at launch. This is free forever. Excitebike 3D Classics will be free until July 7th. Now, the Pokedex one has a, over 150 of the new Pokemon in black and white. There are no Bulbasaur, Charmanders, or um, Squirtles in this one. There are no Mudkips, Torchics, or um, Tricos. There are no... Um, what is that one again? Okay, I hope anything. Wait. There are no Chikoritas, um, Totodiles, and... Um, Wait, okay, let me think. It's Bulbasaur, Squirtle, Charmander, Torchic, um, Totodile, and Chikorita. Okay, that's that's red, blue, gold, silver. And then um, Ruby and Sapphire have Mudkip, uh, Tortwig, and um, the little Piplup. And then, let's see, what else is the other one? Like, uh, Chimchar. Ah, uh, okay, I forgot what that generation is. Well, that's what the internet is for. Man, I'm terrible. And the worst thing is, I've got all of them. <laughs> I have all of them. What was, oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, there's Trico, then. Okay, my grass, my, my water ones are, are Squirtle. Totodile, Piplip, Mudkip, and Oshawott. My fire ones are Charmander, Torchic, um, Tepig is number five. Uh, wow, yeah, um, Chimchar, and um, doo -doo -doo -doo. golly, I've got to make sure I get this right, otherwise they'll they'll take away my license. Gah. Oh, the internet. It has frozen. Oh, well, I can always just check it on my games, but that would take a little bit longer, so I'm not going to do that. Hold on, let me think. Okay. Water ones are Mudkip, Bulbas... Oh, sorry. Okay, well, the, the grass ones are Chikorita, Bulbasaur, um, Trico, Tort Tortiga, and, Sn and Snivy. It's tor Tortic? Tortic. Torchic. Tor not Torchic. Tor Turtwig. Turtwig. Wait, oh wait, I did name them all. Okay, so we've got those. And then for the fire ones, we've got... Yeah, Charmander, um, Chimchar, um, Torchic. What was the fire one for, like, I think, Pearl? Okay, I'm missing something here. Okay, then there's, of course, Tepig, because Tepig is awesome. And then what was the other fire one? There's a... We had a fiery monkey. We had a little fiery, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. shoot. <laughs> That's really kind of embarrassing. Um, okay, let, let's see. I guess I'm going to have to cheat and, and, um, access my, cause I can't for the life of me remember what the, what, what fire one I'm missing. Okay. Now there's, okay, there's, um, yeah, I know this is kind of horrible and boring, but I don't like to be wrong. I don't like to have all my, I should have mentioned this when I had all my, um, all my notes. And if I had working internet at this point, because it decided to freeze. Thank you, Firefox. Thank you, Firefox, for freezing. Well, anyways, while I'm checking that up, let me get down to a bit of brass tacks on this. Um, anyways... This 3D Pokedex uses augmented reality, meaning that you can take some pictures with your AR cards of 
any of the Pokemon that you find. You scan QR code thing. Uh, you scan QR codes to find Pokemon. Not the QR codes that you use for me's, but normal QR codes. And then you um, can set those up to get Pokemon via Spot Pass. And you can collect all 150 plus from the black and Pokemon Black and White. So yeah, there's not a uh, Cyndaquil to be found. Okay, yeah, that's that's horrible. I just turned on the game to check it, and then it came to me. Man, why is Cyndaquil so forgettable? I'm sorry, Cyndaquil, but you are forgettable. I, I feel kind of bad for re not remembering you, but then I don't. Cyndaquil, man. Okay, so, yeah, it's a, um, let me see if I get this. <clears throat> Bulbasaur, Charmander, Squirtle, um, Tor, no, wait, Torchix or Ruby? So we got Cyndaquil, but before that we have, um, ah, and I just lost it again. That's terrible. Okay, our fire types are Charmander, Cyndaquil, Torchic, um, Chimchar, and Tepig. Our water ones are Squirtle, um, Totodile. Yeah, I know. Totodile is kind of forgettable. Um, then Mudkip, Piplup, and Oshawott. Out of those, I like Piplup. The Piplup, I like Piplup. Piplup's kind of cool. And it turns into that awesome looking um, penguin with like the things. And I named it Galleon because it looks like him just a little if he were a penguin. And then we've got a Bulbasaur, Turtwig, Trico, Chikorita. Um, what is the other? Wait, yeah. Bulbasaur, Turtwig. Wait, no. Bulbasaur, Chikorita, Turtwig, um, crud, I just forgot my gra one of my grass starters. Snivy, and then what is that other grass starter? Grass starter, grass starter. I know people are just yelling at their podcast there right now. They're just like, it's, 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 um, crud. Okay. We've got two turtle looking. Wait, we've got a turtle looking thingy. That's Turtwig, Chikorita. What the heck is Chikorita, anyways? Um, <laughs> Bulbasaur. Then what was the green one for that? There's Nivy, and then there's it, it's it's coming to me, and I'm just like not remembering this at all, and I feel kind of bad about it. Because I think I've gone on for about five or six minutes trying to remember this. God. Kids, don't do drugs. <laughs> Actually, probably I would probably remember this if I... Uh, okay, wait. Okay. Chikorita. Trico. Bulbasaur. Turtwig. Snivy. Ah. Uh, okay, then. Yeah, so we've got... Uh, yeah, I, I, I've i got them all now, and I've spent way too much time on that, and I apologize. But yeah, um, you'll be able to catch things, and it's it's just a Pokedex. It shows the moves. It's, um, it's free. It's free forever, and it's awesome. But there is some bad news. Well, actually, before I get to that, i got to get to some awesome news. Apparently, Excite Bike is not a straight NES port, of course. You can save multiple designs for your tracks, and I think you can swap those with other people via Spot Pass, which is awesome. And of course, it's enhanced quite a bit, like with the 3D and graphic wise. So it's kind of NES, but not really NES. You know what I'm saying? Kind of. It's kind of this, but not really that. Yes, vague, vagueness, vague. Hmm. <clears throat> Anywho, let's get into what's not vague. There is a list that Nintendo published today of games that cannot be transferred from DS iWare to the 3DS due to rights issues or other issues. And I have here the list. There are 19 games that you will not be able to bring over. They are 
Art Academy first semester, Art Academy second semester, Asphalt 4, Crash Course Domo, Earthworm Jim, Flip Note Studio, Hard Hat Domo, Let's Golf, Nintendo DSi Browser, Oregon Trail, Pinball Pulse, The Ancients Beckon, Pro Putt Domo, Real Soccer 2009, Real Soccer 2010, Rock and Roll Domo, Sudoku Master, Sudoku Sensei, Sudoku Student, Whitewater Domo. Now, Flipno and the Nintendo 3D, sorry, the Nintendo DSi browser will be getting 3DS versions. I kind of think that Nintendo wasn't able to secure the rights to allow the Domo games to be transferred, and I suspect that Earthworm Jim doesn't transfer due to a pending 3D classic of it. I'm also willing to bet that Oregon Trail and Pinball Pulse will get 3DS Wear updates. Um, either that, or when they were trying to get these approved, the companies had to renegotiate, and some company was like, Well, mm, no. Which happens. As for Art Academy, there's a retail version of Art Academy that contains more semesters and content, so I can see why they didn't port it over. Although, there are some games on the DSiWare service that do contain content from previously released games. And, eh. Okay then. But that's 19 games out of over 370 games. I guess I can be a little disappointed because I own 10 of those titles. Eh, oh well. Thing is, once you transfer something over from DSiWare to 3DSware, you cannot transfer it back to DSiWare. So, that doesn't really matter. Now I gotta figure out which 3DS, sorry, which DS I want to leave Shantae on, and which DS I want to leave Cave Story on, and which DS I want to leave Mighty Milk, uh, Mighty, oh, my Mighty Milky Way, uh, Mighty Flip Champs on, and which one I want to leave Touch Solitaire on. <laughs> oh well. But yeah, the cool thing is, I can transfer over all the, over all the way forward games, all the art style games, all the game and watch games, Trajectile, Touch Solitaire, Kappa's Trail, Alpha Bounce, both calculators, both clocks, Inchworm Animation. Actually, don't be too disappointed about not having Flipnote Studios yet. I mean, you're getting a 3DS version, which will have more features and more colors, but you can transfer over Inchworm Animation at this point. Inchworm Animation is pretty damn great. If you have not checked it out yet, it's put out by a movie studio of all things. And what Inchworm Studios does, sorry, Inchworm Animation does, is it allows you to record stop motion videos or your, make your own animation and save them as pictures or flash cartoons. It, it saves them into FLV format on your on your DSi and it will save them into FLV format on your 3DS so you can work on really complicated frames of animation in fact you can actually have I think the uh, maximum resolution is 9999 by 9999 you can make pictures that are a higher resolution than the DSi and the 3DS are technically capable of doing well actually not so much that resolution it's that size that's your maximum size for those of course, you don't have to do that. You can do all sorts of things with it. I think that if you miss Flipnote Studios and you don't want to worry, don't want to wait till till they launch the 3DS version, pick up Inchworm. Trust me, you'll like it. You can even record music for it. I know you can record music. You can record stop motion video. Inchworm Animation, dude, pick it up. It's worth checking out. Also check over like some other games that will transfer, like Cave Story will transfer over. So you've got no excuse to not to buy it. I mean, you don't have an excuse to not buy it. Pick it up. Also Dark Void Zero, Rayman, Chronos Twins, Spato, the Jason Roar Anthology. If you want to play some depressing one-shot games, yeah. I'm going to have to do a review of his DSiWare title because... The idea of games as an art form, Jason Rohrer, um, is it Rohrer? R-O-H-R-E-R. Rohrer. Rohrer? Rohrer. Rohrer. 
Uh, he makes some interesting games. You can also pick up Flame Tail, 16 Shooting Watch, 99 Bullets, Metal Torrent, all the Electroplankton stuff, all the um, brain training stuff, Mario vs. Donkey Kong, that type of stuff. It's all there. And, yeah, you won't be able to transfer over those a few um, kind of horrible Domo games. I mean, I like Domo, and I will probably not cry myself to sleep over this. Or maybe I will. I, I really haven't decided yet. Um, Domo. Anyhow, Interim Animation. If you don't have it, get it. If you don't own a DSi, um, pick up a 3DS. Make that one of your first DSi work. Or where it purchases. I think it's like 500 or 800 points I have to check or $5 or $8. Anyways, pick it up. It, it's definitely worth checking out. Especially the stop motion animation thing because that's that's pretty cool actually. That's I, I would definitely recommend checking that out. If you're a budding filmmaker or you feel like making stop motion pornography for some reason, I would imagine that would be terribly difficult with real people. Anyways, um, you can download that and it's good. There will be a e video app for the Nintendo 3DS in the future and we'll probably see it at E3. In fact, we'll see it demonstrated at E3 and we'll probably see it released sometime this summer. Oh, um, I forgot to mention earlier when I was talking about the Konami event that they did mention the 30th anniversary of Frogger and the corresponding 3DS game and well, Frogger moves just as fast as he can. Yeah. Go, Froggy, go. Go. Um, yeah, Buckner and Garcia. Look it up, kids. Look it up. And do the Donkey Kong, baby. Yeah, for the um, 30th anniversary, they're celebrating on the 3DS, and then they announce that they have some DLC for uh, Lords of Shadow, for the 25th anniversary of Castlevania, which, if if that's all they do to celebrate Castlevania, that is incredibly lame. Here's what they need to do to celebrate Castlevania properly. I want... I want Castlevania on 3DS Cla 3D Classics, which it is going to be. I want Castlevania 2 up there, and I want Castlevania 3 and Castlevania 4 on there too. Um... I would love to see a 3DS version of the um, anthology that they put out for the PlayStation Portable. You know the anthology that had, uh, I think it was like, it had Dracula X and it had um, Symphony of the Night. Now, I'm sitting here thinking about Symphony of the Night in stereoscopic 3D where there's some depth to the backgrounds and things. Some of the special effects go in and out of the screen. Um... You could have your inventory on the bottom and switch out from different weapons really easily. There's some stuff they could add to it. I'm, I'm thinking of this in like a buttery smooth 60 frames per second. And there's like little... If you can't really hear it, there's little bits of drool just kind of packeting their way in there. Just saying, Philip, think about it. Mmm, Symphony of the Night. Which is a good game. I also would love... um for them to announce like Game Boy Advance games at E3 which is actually coming up to m in my predictions but if they did that Aria of Sorrow, Aria of Sorrow and uh, Circle of the Moon Circle of the Moon it was kind of hard to see when the original Game Boy Advance came out but with the backlit ones and the frontlit ones like the Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Advance SP or on the Game Boy Micro or on the original Nintendo DS or the DS Lite Circle of the Moon is amazing Circle of the Moon is definitely one of the best um, Castlevania games to come out in a long time. And it was a launch title on the Game Boy Advance. Game Boy Advance had such a better launch than the 3DS and the Nintendo DS. The Nintendo DS had this god-awful, almost unplayable port of Super Mario 64. Now there's another game that needs some new respect. Come on. We're getting uh, Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Where is my updated Super Mario 64 3DS that has 3D effects and looks good? Just make it look like that Super Mario, Mario so that, like that a Super Mario DS, I 3DS. 
that one that's coming out that's going to be awesome and has the raccoon tail in it that's going to be awesome but why not after you release that port some of those n64 games over do it i will totally i would totally buy um let's see i totally buy majora's mask and i would totally buy um super mario 64 again and hell if you could if you could convince um Microsoft and Rare, I mean, Rare makes portable games. They've done this for the DS and for the Game Boy Advance, even though they were owned by Microsoft. Just convince them. Be like, hey, you know what? Banjo-Kazooie. That would be great. Do it. Well, somebody needs to, but that's all conjecture, and um, that's not my, those are not my predictions yet. In fact... Looking over my news, let's see how much news I have over here. Do 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 do. Okay. God, Firefox just froze again. Uh, that's what it does all this time. I mean, wow. Firefox, man. If only I had some type of browser on my 3DS, I could be browsing the internet, maybe without HTML5, and maybe without Flash, but I could be browsing the internet while talking instead of relying on this really terrible version of Firefox. What's up with that? Maybe there'll be a patch. I mean, I like Firefox, but sometimes it's a pain in the butt. So, let's get to my three my predictions for E3 2011 for the Nintendo systems. <coughs> So, where do I think Nintendo will be going in 2011? Hmm, for E3 2011, I think they'll announce they'll go for third party. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I kid, I kid. Maybe I could do Michael Pachter's job if anybody wants to pay me for that. <clears throat> so, what do I think Nintendo's going to do? Well, actually, I don't really care about the Wii, so I'm not going to make any predictions on the Wii. Um, well, I do care about it. I do think that we'll probably see the Vitality Sensor and probably that neat little Wii Light thing that they were talking about. Ambient lighting, remember? They had a um, patent for it. Anywho, <clears throat> what do I think about the Nintendo DS presence at E3 2011? Well, I think that the Nintendo DS will have a grand total of 15 to 20 games announced for it. There will be a little bit more DSiWare. DSiWare won't see a slowdown until the end of 2011. We still have some stuff still waiting to be released, like Ikachan, which is from the stu same studio that made Cave Story, same creator. And we have a couple more games. By the way, I I heard somewhere that uh, apparently uh, Shant not Shantae Risky's Revenge, but uh, Mighty Flip Champs is probably going to make its way over to the PlayStation Portable as a PSP Mini. I'm not too sure about this rumor because I think it was from the is like leaked by the ESRB or something. I'm not completely sure. Haven't heard too much about it. But if that's true, well, that's kind of neat. I guess it kind of um kind of goes to show that the PlayStation Portable gets the Nintendo DS's sloppy seconds over here in the United States. Remember, like I said, the PSP in the United States stood for poor sales potential. I mean, people thought it would be great, but just like uh, that Marcus kid, it was a complete loser through and through. Kick him to the curb, and then on the curb. Same with that Kevin Butler guy. Ugh. Okay, I just kind of want to launch birds at him or something. <laughs> Anywho. Hmm. <clears throat> Nintendo DS predictions. Okay, we'll have 15 to 20 titles shown. Um, a couple more DSiWare ones will be shown. There's a few big games still left in DSiWare. Now, hmm... I have a lot of notes here, but I think I should check up. Well, okay, with the Nintendo DS, I expect about 20 games or so. We're going to get um, a few straggling games like Harvest Moon. We're going to get that new Kirby. 
we're going to get the get the fourth Professor Layton game. That's a uh, Professor Layton and the Last Spectre. That's going to be at E3. It'll be mentioned in the conference and it'll be good. So, look forward to that. I know I am. I'm looking forward to it. So, we're going to have the last straggling legs of the Nintendo DS and DSiWare. The problem though, hmm is that the Nintendo DS is right now, well rather normal DS games, is right now in the same position that the Game Boy Color games were around the launch of the Game Boy Advance and where the Game Boy Advance was around the launch of the Nintendo DS. Actually closer to the launch closer to the launch of like where Game Boy Advance games were around the launch of the Nintendo DS. People weren't sure about the Nintendo DS. The launch titles for it were mostly kinda bad. And forgettable. I mean, we had a Pokemon launch game around there, but it was Pokemon Dash. You know, the one where you uh, you don't really control the Pokemon too well. You just kind of swipe your stylus on the bottom screen and hope for the best. And then, like, they didn't actually have anything that really demonstrated kind of why you need two screens and a touch screen until Yoshi's Touch and Go. And then people were like, eh. Then Kirby's Canvas Curse came out and was like, Oh, and then Nintendogs and Brain Training came out, and those captured a lot of the uh, casual market. The thing is, with the Nintendo 3S though, 3DS, you're not really going for the casual market anymore. You're going for the hardcore, or rather, I mean, I hate to use the term hardcore because you could be a hardcore cricket player, or you could be a hardcore quilter. You could be a hardcore um, watcher of reality television. You can be hardcore about anything, even the most benign and kind of silly things. You could be hardcore about flower planting. So when someone's like, I am a hardcore gamer, uh, no, you can't really call yourself hardcore. Other people have to call you hardcore. Other people have to give you that moniker. That's why I think it fails as a marketing ploy. Anyways, um, the Nintendo DS has a few more games in it. I don't think we'll see that Pokemon typing game over here, so don't worry about it. Kind of sad, though. I'd like to have seen it come over here. We'll see a couple straggling RPGs. Unfortunately, the really, really big games left for it are Professor... Well, actually, fortunately, the really big games for it left over are like Professor Layton and the Last Spectre and the new Kirby. And we might actually see Capcom reverse their position on Ace Attorney Investigations 2. You see, the 3DS has kind of, has had kind of a slow start. I think Capcom will look at that and say, hey, you know, we had good success with this. We should bring this over. So I do expect to see something about Ace Attorney 2, sorry, Ace Attorney Investigations 2 at E3. Capcom will have something for the Nintendo DS and that would probably be that something. As for other games from it, we're going to see uh we might see a little bit of Majesco, a little bit of uh Ubisoft. Hmm, camping, yeah. Camping Mama. We're going to see Natsumi still with that Harvest Moon game that's on both the DS and 3DS. So yeah. I'm talking about 15 to 20 DS games and those the big ones will be Kirby um, we might have another small surprise from the team behind Starfy. Um, Professor Layton and The Last Spectre, Ace Attorney Investigations 2, Harvest Moon, um, a another one of the little, um, another thing in the um, Cooking Mama, Camping Mama, Gardening Mama um, series from Majesco, and a few more um, licensed products. One with the green, I mean, we're going to see stuff based on Captain America. And we're just going to, it's pretty, it's pretty bare. Kind of like what, how the PSP is and has been for last year. In the United States, I mean, every three weeks, maybe you get one new PSP game in retail stores. Eh. But yeah, it's going to be a slim picking for the Nintendo DS and DSiWare. But... On the 3DS front of the matter, I think I made this prediction on Nintendojo 
Yeah, I made a prediction on Nintendo Dojo that there will be 80 3DS and 3DS Wear games at the show. 80. And this, of course, includes 3DS Retail, 3DS Wear, and um, I think that the number is a little cheating because I also include 3D Classics. Not Virtual Console, mind you, but 3D Classics. Will we see like uh, 3D Classics for um, Link to the Past? Yes, I think we will. And Adventure in Link and the original Metroid, of course, because didn't they demonstrate that one? I think that we'll see Metroid there. We'll also see the Metroid 2 on Virtual Console, and then we'll also see Super Metroid as a 3D, 3D Classic. And I cannot wait. That is going to be pretty good. As for 3DS Wear, though, we've got, uh, um, was it something in the MUDs? Mm, wait, yeah, um, Mutant MUDs. Okay, yeah. We're going to, like I said, we're going to see 20, 15 to 20 DS games, and they're also DSiWare games, and I'm thinking we're going to see Ikachan, we're going to see uh, a Me Battle. A Mii, a bit, it's a microscopic looking thing. It's quite interesting. Um, we're going to see kind of a thinning of Nintendo DS games, actually, and that's a little sad, but yeah, what can you do? Like I said, Captain America, Cars 2, Doodle Hex, Generator X, Harvest Moon, Hollywood Files, another NCIS one. Also, oddly enough, Sesame Street. Like, not the, not really the, uh, I don't think it'll have anything to do with the Double Fine game, but you never know. Hmm. And of course, X-Men, Spider-Man, the, the usuals, and I think also a game based on Smurf. So, yeah, you're going to see a bunch of movie-licensed Nintendo DS throwaway titles. And that's kind of sad. But for the 3DS, like I said, 80 titles. Like, you're going to see Blood Rain over there. I think we are going to see more of Bl A Boy and His Blob. Um, Contra 3, sorry, Cave Story 3D will be there. Contra will be there. Mm -hmm. Crush 3D will be there. Um, we'll see Chocobo Racing on video, Animal Crossing on video. If they have it playable, then that means we'll probably get it in September. And that's cool. If we get it in September, that's cool. We'll see another reaff a reaffirmation of Etrian Odyssey and maybe a setting or some artwork for it. We'll see a little bit, another trailer for Kingdom Hearts. I don't think it'll be playable. We'll also see a playable thing for Mega Man Legends 3, and then they'll probably put the demo out in near the end of this month. Um, we'll see more of, um, let's see, what games will we see at E3 that haven't been announced? I'm thinking a new Wave Race. I think I mentioned it earlier. And I'm going to go ahead and say Wave Race. Um, we're going to see a version of... Well, yeah, we're going to see Wave Race. We're going to see a version of... Um, oh, what is that other one? Is that Soul Calibur? We're also going to see an announcement about Tekken, if possible. I think we might actually get a Tekken game on the 3DS. Might be interesting. Remember, we got one on the... Uh, on the 360 so it's not a Sony exclusive anymore and the 3DS is I think the 3DS can handle a good Tekken will we see Mortal Kombat I think we'll see a version of Mortal Kombat for the 3DS and then the, the uh, Veda, Vita the Velveeta the cheese the PlayStation cheese oh oh god I just realized something okay Velveeta is a kind of cheese. Remember those terrible, terrible PlayStation commercials with like the obviously racist um, dust balls or a, a mice? I think the mice were supposed to be like black people and the dust balls were supposed to be Mexicans and they're really horrible and racist. Like, remember, it's, it's that mouse that comes by and it's like, yo, yo, what's up, man? Come on. We got to go outside. Blah, blah, blah. You got to go see this. And then it's like, I, I can't. I, I'm looking at cheese. And then the other one's like, dude, they got cheese. You can play outside. You don't have to stay inside. Yeah, remember that? It was the, the PlayStation Portable. It's cheese. You can play outside. And now with the Velveeta name, 
Yes, it totally is. You know, if Sony puts out a yellow cased one at E3 of the Vita, oh, it is on. It is so on at that point. Actually, a yellow one might not be too bad. I mean, they could launch it in yellow and black and, um, yeah, they could launch it in yellow and black. There you go, Sony. There's my free advice for the day. Launch the Velveeta. Oh, in white, moldy green, and yellow. Screw black. Nobody eats black cheese. That's that's bad. That That's like death mold at that point. But yeah, green, yellow, white. Yes, banana colors. Because, Sony, you're bananas. B-A-N-A-N-A-S. But yeah, let's get back to uh, 3DS. We're going to see Sonic Generations. We're going to see... I think at the, at, the, at the convention, they'll announce Game Boy Advance support and finalize Genesis support for 3D Classics. Because you know and I know that... Sega would love to sell you Sonic the Hedgehog 1 again for the 10 millionth time. I mean, I've it's on everything. It's on cell phones. It's on... I, I think the N-Gage even had a Sonic game. Yeah. Yeah, it did. So, yeah, I think that you will see Sega at Nintendo's press conference. The announcement of not just Sega Game Gear... But Sega Genesis on 3D Classics. As for Virtual Boy, I don't think Virtual Boy will be part of the Virtual Console. I know people are like, wait a second, what? What do you mean by that? I think that you'll see Virtual Boy Classics on in 3DSware instead of Virtual Console. And they'll be, I think what they'll do is they'll be like, okay, you can play it in the red. Or you can play it in a kind of limited color version which would actually be wonderful because there's only about 10 virtual boy games there's 3d tetris there's um baseball mario clash wario land tolero boxer nester's funky bowling mario tennis red alarm um there's panic bomber jack brothers bound high dragon hopper um, I'm probably, oh, Waterworld. I don't think we'll ever see Waterworld, um, surface again. Wah, wah, wah. So, yeah, there you go. There's only about ten of them, and I think that Nintendo would be better served by making 3D classics for Virtual, for Virtual Boy instead of Virtual Console. Instead of putting them on the Virtual Console just straight up, they should just put them where you can be like, okay, I can play it in its original red, or I can play it with some limited color added to it. They can spruce it up a little bit and charge us $8 for it, and I would totally buy an updated version of Wario Land VB on 3D Classics. And that would be great. I'd also like to see Neo Geo Pocket Color support. I mean, SNK, come on. The Neo Geo Pocket Color only had about about 40 games. Um, the Lynx would be a good one. Now, I think at one point I said it had like 30 games, but that was like what was what you could find technically. I mean, a lot of um, a lot of Lynx games didn't really make it to retail so much as you could order them from catalogs and get them, or they were reviewed and then not actually released. The Lynx actually has about a hundred titles many of which are ridiculously rare. In fact, they still make some still make Lynx games. There's a crazy contingent of people in the UK who are like, Lynx? The Atari Lynx. It's better than the Super Nintendo. La, 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 la. And they just make me want to hit them with the Lynx. Eh. Eh, long story short, I think that we'll see one more, one more um, portable console added to virtual console and one more normal console added to the 3d classics line so i'm talking 
probably Neo Geo Pocket Color, and then Genesis, which I am so down to play a 3D version of Vector Man. I'm totally for that. 3D version of Sonic 2, especially those those um, bonus stages. 3D version of Sonic 3, okay, I, I'm I'm good with that. I'm down to de- download that. I am DTDL. Yes. And, yeah, that I think that'll happen. Now, with the 3DS, I think we're also going to see a bundle. Now, there's this thing floating around that people will say we're going to see a red Legend of Zelda 25th Anniversary 3DS. Now, I don't understand why it would be red. Red is the Mario color. In fact, they recently released a bunch of older DS Mario games in red boxes so they look kind of like what they did with a new Super Mario Brothers where it's in a red box and like with the Mario All-Stars where that's also in a red box it looks like Mario stuff will be in red cases so a red 3DS for Legend of Zelda doesn't make that much sense I mean, I understand it for like for um, like Earthbound or Mother, as it's called in Japan, or Mario. That makes sense. Now, silver or gold works for The Legend of Zelda. I do think that we are going to see. Well, I heard I heard that um, there's going to be bundles of the system um, coming up this summer, um, about the same price, but it comes with like say Splinter Cell or um, oh, what was the other one that they're trying to package it in with? I think it was like. Ghost Recon or something. There's a third party game in it this time around. I'm like, okay, that's odd. But we'll see Nintendo bundles. Like, I do think that we will see a red 3DS, and I think it might be bundled in with Mario Kart. Um, one thing, too, the picture that's purported to be of a red um, Legend of Zelda 25th Anniversary 3DS has the logo upside down on it. Like, not facing the correct way so that when you open it, the logo would be upside down to people looking at you playing it, which, last I checked, that's not how they did the previous special editions. So, oh, I think it's a Photoshop. I can probably I can see the pixels from here, but yes, that's what it look. That's what they're. That's what they're expecting to do. There's supposed to be some type of Legend of Zelda bundle, but not with the game, not yet. Um, kind of like you buy it and it's preloaded with one of the Legend of Zelda games. Kind of like what they did with the DSi and they bundled it with Mario or they bundled it with Brain Training. Or what they did with the DSi XL where it came with Brain Training. And I was like, okay, that's kind of a little weird. But all that aside, here's what I expect. I expect the 3DS to have at least the announcement of four different bundles, no price drop. You're going to get a solid date for Mario Kart. And a solid um, quarter for Super Mario 3DS. And um, a couple more confirmation on Virtual Console and 3D Classics. Now, here's the fun part of this. This is the part where I go into a bit of the Project Cafe speculation. Now, Project Cafe is the code name for Nintendo's newest system which is expected to launch in er, apparently early 2012. Um, It's not much is known about it, although people have said that, yes, it is more powerful than the PS3 and the Xbox 360. And yes, it is backwards compatible with the Nintendo Wii and GameCube, but it looks like if you want to use the Wii on it, Wii games on it, you're going to need to have the controllers. Because from what it, what I gather, it's not going to be um, like the Wii, where you've got the Wii remote, very simple controls, etc., etc. It looks like the rumors that have to do with the controller are that it has a front-facing camera, a 6-inch touchscreen on the front that does high def, a speaker, a microphone, and um, a more traditional button layout. Um, I think that those particular bits of speculation are interesting, but I think they're also wrong. Um, here's what I think the controller will be like. I think that we're going to get a, um, a 
can, a, um, that will have a screen on it. I think it's going to have a front-facing camera, a back-facing camera, a gyroscope, a back panel touch, back touch panel, a front touch screen that's about the size of the one on the DSi XL, and then of course your traditional button layout, two thumbsticks, two triggers, etc. I do think it'll have rumble in it, and I do think that um, they're going to make pretty good use of the uh, cameras actually. I think that you'll be able to play maybe a demo of a HD version of Face Raiders where you take a take the picture with the main camera and then you customize your char your character with that with that front touch screen and then you can use the controllers to pretty much hunt down your friends in kind of an AR space I'm thinking like molten, like a competitive face raiders I think we'll see a demo of that and I also think that there's going to be um I think that they'll they'll be able to use it in creative ways. I mean, I think that the front facing camera, if that does exist in the controller, will be used to, you know, to map people's faces for in use use in the game. Will be used for like, uh, say, like in a poker game, you have your own set of cards, that type of deal. Just some average stuff. But that's what I think we'll see. I think we'll see about thirty percent of their time being devoted to the Project Cafe. Um, well, I don't think we'll get a final name yet. I think we'll get another code name, but not a final name yet for Project Cafe. I think we probably might not see what the system itself looks like, although there are people saying that it will be playable at the, at the show. Nintendo's not confirmed this. They've just pretty much said, yes, we'll be showing the system. And that's all they've said. That's all the official word on it. Now, Nintendo of Europe says... Yes, we'll have playable kiosks of it, and the tech behind it will be neat. Personally, if it were up to me, if I were designing the controller, if you've been keeping track of what I do on um, other podcasts or on other sites, you might have seen kind of the lengthy, um, well, let's see, I still frequent Nintendojo, and I still like to comment from time to time. I'm, I'm sometimes mentioned on Dojo Shogo or whatnot especially like um, when it's something to do with technology because technology is a thing that most of the technology that I like and would love to see in Nintendo controllers has been around for a while and has been used as weapons like the rumble motors those were originally small generators the speakers those um that's actually based off of the concept where we had guns that would respond and tell people what was going on. Um, one thing I'd love to see in the Project Cafe controller, although I don't think I'll get to see it, would be, <clears throat> it's called, oh, let's see, what is the name of this thing? I'm talking about con sound con conductive units. Um, a while back, there used to be a type of candy called the sound bite candy. It was like a lollipop that uh, was in a little motorized um, device and when you had it in your mouth or when it t or when you touch it to like your arm or so you could hear music it's called bone conduction and you can also do this with surface conduction um, there is a device called the sound bug that was released in 1999 and early 2000 which allowed you to literally put this um sound conductive unit onto a wall and turn it into a speaker. The quality of the sound was determined by the quality of the surface, although we've improved that a bit. In fact, like right now, um, they use it in the military with um, bone conductive headphones. If you have about, if you have about 15 bucks, you can buy conductive, conductive parts and make your own conductive headphones, or if you have about $30 to $279, you can um, buy bone conductive headphones. Nobody else but you can hear them, and they tap into the bones underneath your ear or in your jaw and conduct sound through that. It doesn't hurt your inner ear because it's conducted throughout your entire body. Now, anyone who's messed with the conductive material like that, I mean, 
does know that you can um, send through sound vibrations, you can increase the frequency or the variance of the frequency to provide force feedback. Um, if I were designing the Nintendo Project Cafe controller, like I've said before when I would uh, we did a lot of older articles designing what the next Game Boy would be or what they should do to the Nintendo DS. Like for example, I've been preaching the attributes of the organic LED for so very long and oddly enough Sony's the one that listened. <laughs> um but yes, I think that conductive technology is where we need to go. And it's important that we get there pretty darn soon, actually, because one, we can save some money. The technology is really cheap. What I'm ex I'm expecting, if I were designing the Project Cafe controller, would be it would be kind of like the um, think like a small, slightly stretched version of the GameCube controller, but with slightly different button placement. The middle screen, of course, would be about the size of the screen on the Nintendo DSi XL, which I think they're going to do anyways. It wouldn't be HD because we don't need it. You don't need an HD screen in your controller. It's just frivolous and expensive at this point. You have all these other screens from their other portable devices that you can use. And Nintendo likes to use something called withered technology. The idea of withered technology is you use technology that's old for new purposes. You see, touch panels have been around for a while Multi-touch panels are something that, even though Nintendo hasn't put any in anything before, they've been around since 2000, since before 2006. I have, I'm kind of a bit of a science buff. I really enjoy reading about new technology, seeing new technology, but I do believe that we need to go to conductive audio conduction for the controller, because you can actually using you can use this to conduct say rumble effects you don't need a rumble motor for those if you have conductive technology rather audio conduction you can concentrate the audio conduction into various spots so like let's say we're using copper for the conduction unit in the inside now copper is a porous metal being a porous metal it allows air and it also reacts really nicely to electrical vibrations and to sound vibrations that's why you see copper wiring, et cetera, et cetera, because it's a very conductive and porous material. If we have a, have a thin layer of copper inside the controller be under, behind the back touch panel, you can use the audio conduction for it to pinpoint and put out audio vibrations into different points of the controller. Meaning that, let's say, if you have it set to say warn you, like let's say in a zombie game, the front screen has a has like a I guess some type of zombie radar let's say you're not actually watching your screen at the bottom and you're playing the game the left hand part of your controller will start kind of humming a little bit and causing that little vibration so you'll feel that in your left hand signaling oh I should check to see if there's something to my left on the zombie radar on the screen I also think that we're gonna have gyroscopes in the controller for the Project Cafe but well back on to if I were designing it of course if I were designing it they'd all be brushed aluminum they'd be rubberized brushed aluminum 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 kind of like how the gizmondo was I mean the gizmondo was um kind of velvety to the touch and oh just wonderful kind of what they do with the micro where it's metal but this would be covered with a rubberized form um set so if you drop it it bounces it's fine which is good news for durability bad news for whenever you throw it into your TV <laughs> um, I do think that yeah the project project cafe we'll see about 10 to 15 tech demos 10 to 15 is a pretty magic number here at, e at E3 pretty good prediction and you can usually bet money on that but I'm not gonna bet money on that because eh, I'm poor so poor but yes I do think that we're gonna see project cafe up there and it's going to have a slightly different screen in it and possibly a back panel and front back cameras gyroscope rumble etc and i do think that all those components inside that controller will, will probably make that controller cost about 60 bucks but 
all things considered, and that's what controllers cost these days. It's kind of sad. Oh well, technology, it's something we have to live with. Now, if I were designing this controller, if I really wanted to be really unique, and this is something I'd love to see in the next portable, um, there's a type of technology that we have now that's called, mm, let me see if I can find, remember what the name is. It's a, uh, well, if you're up to me, it would have, we would have RAM batteries, we'd have rubberized metal casings, conductive metal metal buttons where when you push like a button it has a sound response to it and it sends like a tingle in your fingers because of that. But we one thing that I would love to see us do, it's called resonant inductive coupling. Resonant, resonant inductive coupling is the process of taking atmospheric electricity or sending electricity out of another, another source to another source. In other words, it's drawing electricity from the static and the air around us. Um, if you look up Nikola Tesla, Nikola Tesla invented the very first um, resonant inductive couplings and these were intended so that you could have essentially an electrical field that works without wires or draws electricity from something else in the atmosphere around it. What I'd like to do is couple one of these with Nintendo's next handheld. If we could do this with Nintendo's next handheld, after your initial charge, you could keep the system still charged by just playing it because it would draw the extra electricity it needs to recharge itself by being close to your body. I know people are like, wait, that sounds dangerous. It's not. It doesn't radiate it doesn't, it doesn't radiate. It's not radiation. It's magnetic. Uh, magnetism, and rather the magnetic poles, are all around us. Everything exudes magnetism. Nikola Tesla showed us this with the resonant inductive couplings that, t coupling towers that he invented. We could use this in, say, a new handheld to keep it charged. I mean, Microsoft wants to turn you into the controller. If you're up to me... I would turn you into the battery. I I know that sounds kind of awful, but like I said, like for example, the sound bites or the conductive, um, the sound conduction units I've been talking about, those have actually been around since the 1960s. In fact, the uh, sound bite candy that Hasbro put out, those were about ten bucks back in 1998. So not only is that conductive technology ridiculously cheap, it's ridiculously refined. It's the best type of withered technology, and hopefully we'll see something like that in the Nintendo controller, although I kind of doubt it. I think we're going to see a kind of drawback in terms of innovation from where the Wii was. The Wii, or the revolution, really was. It took gyroscopes and stuff that we've had before. I mean, look, they used it with Kirby's Tilt and Tumble. Oh, that occurs to me that they should pro they might also use something like um, light detection. Remember the game Boktai for the Game Boy Advance? Light detection is something I'd also like to see in a controller. Actually, yeah, I'd like to see that in the next handheld. Um, I'd like to see us use more RF, more RFID style uh, transmissions and more of this technology. There's a lot of really old technology that's still really good still really cheap and can be used in innovative ways for example the harmonic um, induction sorry not induction the audio transduction that I've been mentioning the the ones that are used in the Hasbro soundbite pops and in bone conductivity headphones that technology has actually been yeah like I said it's been around since the 60s it was originally designed as a weapon um, harmonic weapons are something we've actually had since the 1980s. In fact, like they're actually testing them out in some police forces in New York, L.A., and um, California, Michigan, Illinois. A couple places are testing these for use by the police. Instead of a taser, they shoot something that looks a little bit like a like a megaphone at you, and it's literally. They've been able, they can take down a grown person with just the excruciating pain 
that these ultrasonic waves cause. Now, I don't intend for your controller to cause you horrible physical pain, but if you dial that back a, back a bit, that type of stimulation is what you see behind, say, rumble packs and such. People want to feel some type of feedback from their game, and I do think that the next step up is sound conduction, meaning you're holding that controller, it is not only responding to you, like to your tactile um, responses, like the button presses and such, or when you move it. It's not only detecting that and using the camera to detect where it is as well. In fact, actually, if you put two controller, two cameras in there, you don't have to have actually put a gyroscope in there because then you can use those cameras to detect where the camera, where the, um, what position the controller is in. Kind of like how the Nintendo Wii remote works, where on top of your comp uh, top of your TV is a sensor bar which contains two lights, and inside the controller is a single camera. In fact, I think they might just reuse that camera twice on the Nintendo Project Cafe. But of course, this could all be wrong, but I don't think I'm that far off the mark. In fact, we'll find out this upcoming Tuesday what Project Cafe is and what they're going to do with this technology. What's so special about it? What are, what are they going to do? Well, I guess you're kind of lucky that uh, I'm not the one designing the controller because, the, oh man, some of the technology I, I think I'll talk about on another podcast or another Radio DMG. Like, oh, I want your controllers to light up for you. I want your controllers to change temperature depending on what's happening on the screen. And we can do that. We can have our have controllers draw their electrical source from you. I know some of that sounds a little bit dangerous, but it's not. And I'm pretty sure here at Aperture Science we've got the test to prove it. No, I'm kidding. Actually, yeah, uh, I'm not so much kidding about like the idea of conductive, uh, indu sorry, resonant inductive coupling. Go ahead and look up Weetricity. In fact, I think it was in 2000. 2009 there was a company um, at MIT where they created something they refer to as what why Weetricity W-I-T-R-I-C-I-T-Y essentially the idea is inside of a converter there are two bars where the electricity is conducted between those two bars invisibly and wirelessly however people weren't sure about how to take those take those away from each other without losing or dissipating the electrical field. Now, some students at MIT attacked this problem and invented Weetricity. I'd love to see that in use on a new console or on a new handheld, and if we're lucky, we'll see that hit our homes sometime in 2015, 2016. In fact, uh, do check out the uh, TED talk um, I do check a lot of science because, hey, if you're, if, you're, if you're a person who helps design controllers or helps and looks at the future of controller technology or the future of handhelds, you have to be up to date on the technology, on how this works. And I will suggest some stuff for people to read up in future, pod, future radio DMGs. In fact, excuse me. In fact, we might be launching a radio DMG where not only will I teach you some science, I'll also try and teach you some history. So look forward to that. But before that, we've got a lot of E3 and Acon stuff to go through. Well, before I turn this off for the night, because I think we're coming up to, oh, let's see, do, 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 do. yeah, we're getting mighty close to that two-hour mark, and. I think it's about time that I do something I haven't done since the first show, and it's something that I've been meaning to do, I just haven't done. I'm going to do shout-outs to um, some of the other podcasts and stuff that I listen to. Now, I don't listen to too many podcasts. In fact, like if I look at my podcast list right now, there's Film Spotting, Giant Bomb, Plugged In, Kojima Productions. I like Koijima. I, I really do. He's a little behind the times, but he's great. I listen to Freakonomics. 
overclocked um I checked overclocked remix frequently, the Spodcast, the HP Podcast, Cross Border Gaming, Nintendo Joe, the Meta Podcast, um Grammar Girl. I, I don't know why, but yeah, I like grammar. Linguistics. Wall Builders and the Cato Institute's daily podcasts. So let me actually go through some of these first. Now um I've been listening to the Giant Bombcast for a while. I used to listen to Retronauts. Um, I used to listen to a bunch of different podcasts, but I kind of narrowed it down to listening to the Giant Bombcast because they're the most frequently funny. They're um, they're a video game related podcast, and like I said, they're found at like um, www.giantbomb.com. That's G I A N T B O M B dot com, and they're they're they update every Tuesday. And they're pretty long, too. They're usually about two and a half to three hours long. And they have a bunch of mini podcasts closer to E3. Now, they're good. Now, another one I listen to is Film Spotting. That's Film Spotting, F I L M S P O T T I N G dot net. Film Spotting is about, is by two critics out of Chicago. It's actually on public radio as well. And, um,. I don't often agree with them, but when I do, it's for good reason. Um, they're pretentious. They ha- they're um, they hate quality movies. No, I'm kidding. They're they're pretty great, but I disagree with them on a bunch of stuff. Um, like for example, Meek's Cut Off, Wendy and Lucy, a couple other films that they've reviewed. Where I'm like, yeah, I think you guys kind of missed the point on that one, but. They do occasionally have some pretty good recommendations. Right now, they're going through the Three Colors trilogy um, as part of their. Um, they also teach like courses about film appreciation. If you ever want to expand your repertoire of film appreciation, because hey, if you're going to criticize things or be a critic, or if you want to learn more about an art, it's best to look at people who delve into the art very seriously. Well, yeah, they'll throw out a good amount of homework because these are people who they'll tell you if something's like a David Fincher product or a Lynch product or oh that's kind that's got some great some shades of a Kurosawa in it. That type of deal. Um if you want to expand your knowledge of movies, I would definitely recommend film spotting. You just have to put up with a they are somewhat pretentious opinions from time to time. That being said, they also have a weekly contest called Massacre Theater, where they take a popular um, section from a from a movie and just completely overact it and butcher it. That is the that is the best part of their podcast, in my opinion. Another one I listen to is Plugged In podcast. It's actually a division of a uh, Plugged In from Focus on the Family. Now. I know people are like, wait a second, what? No, they look at stuff from a biblical perspective and they put out family-friendly reviews about whether or not some a new video game or a new music CD or a new movie is appropriate for your family or children. There are a lot of people who look at art and culture and realize that they forget that there is a responsibility that artists have. When you are creating a product... You are responsible for that product. And at times, you have to admit, yeah, there are some people who are ridiculously ridiculously uh, impressionable and won't get it. But that's where places like Plugged In come in. For people who want to make sure that they're watching quality stuff or they're letting their kids watch something that they would agree with, it's the be- it's one of the best ones to check out. They're at www.plugg edin dot com. That's uh, that's uh, plugged in. Now Kojima report. That's uh, a bit long. That's um, the Kojima Productions report has to do with Konami, and it's pretty darn long. And it's also out of Japan. There's an English version of it. Uh, my suggestion is just to Google it, because <laughs> it's a uh, it's pretty long. Now Freakonomics Radio. Freakonomics is a, a book by Steve Dubner and I think Mark, Mark, uh, Mark, not Mark Leonard. I'm trying to remember what his name is like. Hmm. Anyways, Freakonomics is based off of the book 
It's the people who wrote the book, and they go into some crazy great subjects. Um, if you're very sensitive about certain material, I would actually stay away from this, from Freakonomics, because it'll hurt your head. <laughs> um, they're actually, um, they're owned by APR, so they're public, American Public Radio, and their podcast is actually... Um, sponsored in part by the New York Times, but they're the only one of the only good things to come out of the New York Times. Um, their books have been controversial. Freakonomics, actually, uh, the first one, had um, an interesting supposition that claimed that the reason crime went down in the United States was because the abortion rate went up. And while that sounds like obnoxious, it kind of is, but they do make a pretty good case for it. Their... Um, Shows shows go from like they did one on the economy of trash collecting. They've done they're doing one um, a big special on why um, Las Vegas is the suicide capital of the United States. They also uh, they've also done ones about um, everything from like I said everything from like trash collection to transpusions. I'm not going to explain what that is. Check out Freakonomics Radio. Go ahead and Google it. It's spelled F-R-E-A-K-O-N-O-M-I-C-S, radio. Check it out. Um, Smodcast is from Kevin Smith and Scott Mosher. Kevin Smith is director of uh, um, Clerks, Clerks 2, Chasing Amy, uh, Mall Rats. He apologized for that several times. Um, oh, what was the other ones? Cop Out, which he also has apologized several times for. And, um, oh, what was that other one? Shoot, there was that one with Ben Affleck, and it had George Carlin in it, and some little girl, and, oh, I'm trying to think. Jersey with the, No, yeah, yeah, Jersey Girl. The, uh, yeah, Jersey Girl. He's apologized for that one several times, too. <laughs> he has a, has actually this, it, that's at smodcast.com, that's S M O D. C A S T dot com. And uh <laughs> it's um pretty funny, not safe for work at all, because he talks a lot talks a lot about like uh well he talks it's it's like his movies. He talks about sex and drugs. Actually the best podcast on there, there's plus one, which is him and his wife, and they fight most of the time and it's funny. Then there's Smodcast, which is him and his um, one of his producers, Scott Mosier, and they're pretty funny. They talk about current events. And then there's Kevin Smith and Jason Mewes, um, you know, Jay and Silent Bob. They have a uh, a podcast called Jay and Silent Bob Get Old. I would actually recommend people check out at least the first five episodes of that one because uh, Jason Mewes, they actually use the podcast as a way of keeping him clean. Um, he goes through and accounts... Through those first five episodes, um, his entire history with drugs, because it's part of keeping him clean, part of keeping him away from that. And um, even though I still think that they need to keep Kevin Smith away from food and pot, that way they might be able to get him onto planes. I know, old joke. But yeah, check it out. It's pretty funny, but it is not safe for work. Another one that's also kind of a little not safe for work depending is HP Podcraft, the HP Lovecraft literary podcast. Right now they're on part three of um, the mountains and madness, which is probably going to be like a five or six part um, podcast. Cause that is actually HP Lovecraft's longest work of literary fiction. Um, what they do is they started with some of his earlier, fi earlier stuff and about, uh, there's several, ep they're like, they're literally like, I think they're at like almost 100 episodes in because they've been going chronologically through his work, meaning they read through like the Cats of Ulthar and um, Whisper in the Dark and all that. So, yeah, they got through a bunch of terrible stuff like his um, book, The Mound. But they've also gone through or the uh, the dream cast quest of Kad Kadar, Kath some of those those ones. They've gone through a lot of it and they appro they approach it. With they 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 talk about the story. They talk about the time or that time that it was written. Um, a little bit of history about it, where H.P. Lovecraft was at that point. By the way, H.P. stands for Howard Phillips. 
His full name is Howard Phillips Lovecraft. And uh, yeah, they go and they talk about different issues like the political climate. Um, Because H.P. Lovecraft was um, a bit xenophobic. He was very suspicious of science. He was very suspicious of, um, I guess you could say, he was downright racist. He, He literally was. But not to apologize for some of his writings which do have a racist subtext to them, like the the horror at Red Hook, or, um, oh, the Medusa's Coil. I'm not going to go ahead and defend those, but I do suggest people check out the HP Podcraft. It's H-P-P-O-D-C-R-A-F-T dot com. Check it out. You'll learn more from this particular podcast than you would from actually tracking down a lot of these books, which um, with a lot of his stories... Listening to the who um these people get through those, yeah. H.P. H.P. Lovecraft wrote a lot. He's not anywhere near as prolific as say um, mm, let's see who else wrote a lot. Philip K. Dick. I haven't found a Philip K. Dick podcast yet, but if I did, I'm pretty sure that would go on for a lot of episodes. The next one up on my list is cross border gaming. I've been on Cross Border Gaming a couple of times, and it's with uh, my friends uh, Harold and Frank, otherwise known as H Bomb and E Master. Aside from some uh, singing um, and the cheapy D rap, they've got a pretty good repertoire. In fact, like, uh, do keep in mind though that it is not safe for work because there is some cursing, and um, eh, I think I'm probably to blame for part of that. <laughs> So, but yeah, check that one out. That's at crossbordergaming.com. It's C-R-O-S-S-B-O-R-D-E-R-G-A-M-I-N-G.com. Next one up is Nintendojo. That's N-I-T, sorry, N-I-N-T-E-N-D-O-J-O.com. Um, I used to work there a long, long time ago. They have something called Dojo Show Go, and it's every week, and it's pretty decent. And then there's the Meta Podcast, which is... Uh, Excuse me, the Meta Podcast, T H E M E T A P O D C A S T dot P O S T E R O U S dot com. That's uh, the Meta Podcast dot posterist dot com. It's a uh, it's po- hosted by two girls who go by the monikers of red and blue, and uh, they talk about Pokemon. And they're about fourteen episodes in, and um, they're interesting. They're big point of um sale with this would be Pokemon Snap where they spend a little time um making fun of whatever particular Pokemon they picked at that point. They've done a couple podcasts on like the spin-off games, they had a podcast about the generations, they had a two-part podcast on IV and EV training, which is definitely worth checking out. Now, here we're going to go into another one that I like is a uh, Grammar Girl. Now, it's from it's actually Grammar Girl's dirty, Quick and Dirty Tips for Better Writing. Um, if you've read anything on DMGIs.com in forever, you know that grammar is not my strongest suit. <laughs> or sweet, or whatever, suit. It's not my strength. So I try and find out what my weaknesses are and attack them viciously attack them like they were delicious cake and I was a fat person. Mmm, cake. Anyways, Grammar Girl is, um, there's a book for it, but it also, they're really short podcasts about mm, six to 15 minutes long on different grammar rules or questions that people ask. For example, one of the latest ones was about, um, if it's okay to say, Someone has graduated college. Technically, it's supposed to be has graduated has graduated from college. And then they, she goes through the um, originally there's a couple of words that are missing from that. It used to be a much longer phrase. But if you want to know a little bit about the in- entomology of uh, linguistics <laughs> or the uh, nature of words, it's definitely worth checking out. In fact, I would I would suggest it. It's quite a bundle of goodness. So, uh, that's actually, um, uh, go ahead and look up Grammar Girls. Um, 
and you'll probably find it on Google pretty quickly. The next one up is Wall Builders. Now, Wall Builders is from David David Barton and uh, Steve Green. Now, Wall Builders is another Christian podcast, but what they do is they go into they they go into the history of the United States, or rather, the history in relation to religion and political 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 um science. Now, um, David Barton was on the Daily Show. Well, part of his interview is on a lot of people. Like you'll see, say, for example, remember that um, Katie Couric interview with Sarah Palin. Apparently, there's 75 minutes of footage that are on the cutting room floor from that. One thing that you see a lot in interviews is that somebody will set up a leading question, and then another question to follow up on that leading question like say a theoretical, and then they'll cut back the leading question from the final cut. For example, like I was going to say, oh, you know, do you like ice cream? And someone say, yeah, I like ice cream. Would you enjoy ice cream more than, than some type of obnoxious thing? But give me a little bit there. I could probably put together a string of questions that leads you to saying something about like, oh yeah, killing puppies is okay. Then I can just go back there and cut that interview so that I get the sound bite I want. Now here on Radio DMG, we don't cut the interviews. We only censor something if somebody asks us specifically to do so. In fact, the only time I've ever really cut audio is either to cut out a name of an unrelated person, and you'll see like a little blip in the audio, or to cut out something that the person I'm interviewing said to leave out or to cut out. I don't cut interviews because I don't do lead in questions and then delete them. I don't believe in misleading journalism. And that's why I don't watch MSNBC. And that's why I would never hire Katie Couric. By the way, ABC, don't hire her. Don't do it. Don't. Bad news. Bad person. She needs to go begging or something. She should be flipping burgers instead of reading news. So yeah, Katie Kirk's going to show up at my doorstep and be like, I heard what you said. I'll be like, yeah, whatever. And then, you know, then I'll tell her to go make me a hamburger or something. (laughs) So anyways, um, and I think that brings me to, well, my, one of my final, um, shows in this really long and extended, um, shout out. And that would be, I really like the Cato Institute. Now, they have a daily podcast. The Cato Institute is a libertarian think tank. I'm not really sure where they're located, but they go into topics like the war on drugs, um, the American imperialism and what it actually means. They go into the definitions of classical liberalism. They had a really great discussion on Robert Heinlein. And um, I think they're worth checking out. It's Cato, C-A-T-O dot O-R-G. And um, their daily podcast is something that I, I do check out a lot of. I've also started listening to the one on um, uh, Destructoid. You can just look it up like dtoid.com. Destructoid actually has a podcast, and that's kind of interesting, although not safe for work. Another one that I listen to is um, the ANN um, cast, or the ANCast. Um, that's the Anime News Network podcast. But why it's important to listen to this one, even if you're not a big anime fan. If you like business or the business side of things, or you want to know why the anime industry is in such a wreck, it's a good idea to check out the ANCAST. Unfortunately, it is run by two of the most pretentious people. Um, They're kind of like the people from Film Spotting. Although, um, I do have to agree with them. Morver and Calair is a pretty good film. But... They're kind of pretentious. They don't really like a lot of the newer shows and a lot of the older shows. And they are, they are trained critics. So that's kind of interesting. One of them used to work with, uh, anime, I'm sorry, uh, Central Park Media before it died. And I think he got jaded because Central Park Media used to own a lot of horrible, horrible licenses and a lot of hentai. And he ended up having to, uh, do the sound editing and mastering on all of those practically. So yeah, there's some jaded people behind this particular show. (laughs) 
but it's worth checking out. You can find them at AnimeNewsNetwork.com. That's A-N-I-M-E-N-E-W-S-N-E-T-W-O-R-K. A lot of the podcasts that I've mentioned so far in this long and extended shout-out belong to, well, a lot of them are weekly, and um, they're definitely worth checking out. There's a huge variety, and I do add shows all the time, or I take shows out all the time. I used to listen to this one called One Life Left for a while, and then it got kind of like drab. And, you know, British accents, you can only take so much. You really can. I've got other stuff that I was listening to. But yeah, if you like Radio DMG, you should check out a bunch of those. We've got a lot of people that I need to put out other shout outs to different websites. Um, check out some of our friends. Um, if you go to gmgice.com, that's D-M-G-I-C-E dot com, um, do like us on Facebook, do follow us on Twitter, do like each of these radio pod- radio DMG shows on the Radio DMG Go to Facebook and like us. Uh, Do that. Hit those little like buttons. Hit that. Let people know. Let's use the social media. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Subscribe to us on iTunes, even though it messes up all the darn time. Um, Subscribe to us on Flickr. Definitely check it out and look forward to our E3 and Acon coverage. Our next bit of next Radio DMG will be covering a little bit of what's mentioned at the at the um, conferences. And a little bit of an upcoming thing for Akon. Now, Akon's interesting this year because not only will we have Peter S. Beagle there again, he's the author behind The Last Unicorn. I'm going to see if I can get him to sign my Blu-rays for those. But he's all, we also have um, Team Ninja will be there showing off Ninja Gaiden 3 and some other, to- other um, things. There's going to be a Dead or Alive Dimensions tournament with cash prizes. There's a couple other companies that will be there, like Viz Media will be there, Aniplex will be there. Um, Funimation will be there. Bandai Visual has um, a little bit there with Anaplex. And you're going to see other voice actors, lots of webcomic people, and we'll see what we can get. Hopefully, we'll, we can get some nice choice interviews for you, our loyal listeners. And thank you for putting up with this two and two, almost two and a half hour long podcast. Um, I'm your host, Philip Wesley. You're listening to Radio DMG. And good night. Sunday, bloody Sunday. You too. Yes, I can't believe the news today. Oh, I can't close my eyes and make it go away. How long, how long must we sing this song? How long, how long? Because tonight, we can be as one. Tonight, broken bottles under children's feet. Bodies strewn across the deadened street. But I won't heed the battle call. It puts my back up puts my back up against the wall. Sunday, bloody Sunday. Sunday, bloody Sunday. Sunday, bloody Sunday. And the battle's just begun. There's many lost, but tell me who has won. The trench is dug within our hearts, and mothers, children, brothers, sisters torn apart. Sunday, bloody Sunday. Sunday, bloody Sunday. How long, how long must we sing this song? How long, how long? Because tonight, we can be as one. Tonight, tonight. Sunday, bloody Sunday. Sunday, bloody Sunday. Wipe the tears from your eyes. Wipe your tears away. Oh, wipe your tears away. Oh, wipe your tears away. Sunday, bloody Sunday. Oh, wipe your bloodshot eyes. Sunday, bloody Sunday. 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 And it's true, we are immune. When fact is fiction and TV reality, and today the millions cry, we eat and drink while tomorrow they die. Sunday, bloody Sunday. The real battle just begun to claim the victory Jesus won on Sunday, bloody Sunday. Sunday, bloody Sunday. Morning, Maya.